Move on to oral questions put by members to ministers, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question through you is to the Premier. Sometime this summer, or maybe even fall now, cannabis is going to be legal. I remain concerned that this government has not taken sufficient steps to ensure all the safeguards are in place to make sure legalization happens in a safe and orderly way in our province. And I'm not the only one that has this concern, Mr. Speaker. Municipalities in Nova Scotia are worried about what the legalization of cannabis will mean to their bottom line, especially their policing costs. What does the Premier expect the extra price tag to be for policing once cannabis becomes legal? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Minister of Justice uh, for the tremendous work that he's been doing on this file, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as you know, every Canadian province is meeting uh, the requirement that was set out by the federal government to ensure that uh, marijuana is legalized uh, this year. Uh, we're going to continue to work with our partners, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that uh, the costs associated with this will be reflected in the finances they receive from the respective levels of government. But it's our belief, quite frankly, that the greatest amount of cost borne by any level of government will be borne by the Nova Scotia government, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, that was an interesting answer, considering that the Federation of Canadian Municipalities estimate the annual policing costs associated with the legalization of cannabis will be between two to three million per 500,000 in population. That means, Mr. Speaker, municipalities in Nova Scotia could be responsible for around six million in extra policing costs, and I can table that, Mr. Speaker. For many, it is an increased cost they can't afford. Many municipalities are facing an increasing number of financial pressures already. How much money is earmarked in the upcoming budget to help municipalities absorb the increased policing costs? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. I want to thank all our municipal partners across the province who have been working very hard with our government over the last uh, four years. Uh, to continue to make sure that we ensure that we provide uh, the proper services to uh, our respective uh, constituents. Uh, we're going to continue to do that. If they have issues around uh, policing costs, uh, we're more than happy to have that conversation with them, Mr. Speaker. But let me be clear, uh, there is no great revenue source here coming in from this product. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, uh, we don't see a level of income that will be there that will be reflected to the impact. I've already given word to the Minister of Finance, don't spend any money that the opposition think is coming with this product because it just isn't there. We believe the costs associated with this, health, the social ramifications that are that will be borne by the province of Nova Scotia, and we'll work with those municipalities, Mr. Speaker, who have policing costs, but let me be very clear to those municipalities as I stand on the floor of this house, and she can communicate it to them. They will have to prove to us that those costs are real. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on her final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I did not hear that there was any money put in the budget for this most important piece of legislation. The UNSM has analyzed the increased police costs they will bear when cannabis is legalized. Some of the costs include drug recognition, recognition training, uh, the purchase and ongoing costs associated with roadside screening equipment and supplies, increased caught course costs and education regarding the new laws and safety. These are just to name a few. We know the federal government has decided to share the proposed cannabis excise tax with the provinces. So will the Premier commit today to sharing the revenue from the cannabis excise tax with our cash strapped municipalities? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, uh, many of the costs that the Honourable Member just identified were one-time costs associated with upfront costs, preparing those police forces to be to be ready for when this product become legal, whether it's training, ensuring they have the appropriate equipment. Mr. Speaker, we'll ensure that that happens in this province. We'll continue to make sure that that cost is shared and that we support them in that journey. But that is a very different situation than an ongoing cost associated with implementing this law. If you can, Mr. Speaker, we have breathalyzers in cars today. We will train police officers to operate those. We will also train police officers to operate the devices used to detect marijuana. And we'll continue to work with our partners to ensure that our community stays safe. <clears throat> the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this week, the case came to my attention of a senior in Sydney who was admitted under emergency circumstances requiring surgery to the Cape Breton Regional Hospital last fall. 
And upon his arrival, because there was no surgeon available, he was rushed by ambulance to Antigonish, where six hours later he received the surgery. While there was a surgeon in Antigonish, there were no beds available, and so this patient was returned to Sydney by ambulance to be admitted late in the afternoon the next day. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Premier, when our health care system is stretched so thin as to require a senior to travel 434 kilometers in the course of an emergency surgery, does he not understand why people would refer to that as a crisis? Yes. Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know all the circumstances associated with the case that the Honourable Member brings to the floor, but it's unacceptable. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, paramedics and ambulance services are a lifeline for people in medical crisis. When we call 911 in any community in Nova Scotia, it's essential that these people are be able to respond. The crisis created by this government in health care, however, has paramedics and ambulances stuck in emergency rooms accompanying the patients who are lining the halls there. Mr. Speaker, this morning at 20 minutes to 7, here in the central zone, there were exactly no ambulance units available to answer calls. Zero. Mr. Speaker, how does the Premier respond to his government's failure to meet even the most basic standard of the availability of ambulance services? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to work with our partners across the province. As all members of this House would know, including the Honourable Member, the fact this is not a new situation in our province. We've had this issue where ambulances have gone into emergency rooms for a very long time, where they've been held up for periods of time, which in, in essence during the ambulance services caused a domino effect across our province where we're leaving some communities vacant. It's unacceptable. We recognize that. We'll work with our partners to alleviate the challenges and look for new opportunities to see if we can solve uh, that what is an unacceptable situation. Our highly trained paramedics should not be waiting in hospital parking lots or in hospital emergency rooms. They should be in their rigs, in communities, ensuring they're responding to the needs of communities. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party on his final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When the Premier was questioned by media not long ago about some of the questions that have been, the, the criticisms that have been directed towards his government, he said, we are going to govern as we have governed. We won't listen to the noise. So here's the question. As the evidence of a health care crisis continues to mount, does the Premier not realize that it is he who has become the noise and that he continues to lose credibility as a steward of the health care of the province? The Honourable Premier. No. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question through you is to the Minister of Justice. As part of the consultation process around the legalization of cannabis, the government called for submissions and they got 107 pages of recommendations. The Canadian Cancer Society recommended that the age be 21. Mothers Against Drunk Driving recommended the age be 21. The IWK Health Centre urged the government to establish an evidence-based legal age for the consumption of 21. The Association of Psycho Psychologists said 21. The Public Health Association of Nova Scotia said 21. Smoke-Free Nova Scotia said 21. And I'll table all those points, Mr. Speaker. This government, sadly, set the age at 19. Why did the government ignore the advice of the Cancer Society, MAD Canada, the IWK, the Association of Psychologists? The Why, Honourable Mr. Minister of Justice. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question from my colleague from Pictou West. Uh, to be quite honest, uh, Mr. Speaker, we didn't ignore uh, the feedback that we received from all of those organizations. The feedback we received was, was some of and, and, and part of the factors considered, Mr. Speaker, in the larger decision-making process to arbitrarily land on an age where we know the highest consumption in Canada is amongst our youth in Nova Scotia. There has to be a balance between appropriate age, health factors, continued use of illicit market, and a number of other contributing factors, Mr. Speaker. The other, the other factor we're conscious of is, is what our neighbouring provinces have done, Mr. Speaker, relative to age. We believe, in the best interest of Nova Scotians and the application of the legislation, 19 is the most appropriate age, as our par provincial partners have identified across the country. Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
It's not good enough. Everyone knows better that it should have been 25, a compromise should have been 21. Another organization sent a submission to the government. It's an organization that we talk about a lot here in the legislature, actually. Here's what the nine community health boards had to say about the sale of cannabis to young people. Restrict sales of cannabis to those 21 years of age and older, which has also been recommended both by the Canadian Medical Association and the Canadian Psychiatric Association, and I can table that. Mr. Speaker, that's the recommendation of this group this government created. When the vast majority of health organizations recommended setting the legal age for cannabis to be 21, how did this government ever come up with the age of 19? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Th thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and I want to go back to what I said earlier, Mr. Speaker. The <clears throat> largest percentage of consumers are amongst our youth in the country. To set a legal age at 25, Mr. Speaker, to set a legal age at 25, Mr. Speaker, is actually continuing to support the criminal element. Those, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, those youth would continue to purchase product from the illegal market. I am not naive to think that those individuals are going to stop consuming because the legal age is 25. We've struck a balance, Mr. Speaker. We believe the age of 19 is appropriate, consistent with every other province and territory with the exception of one. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister no, just of when you're Order, please. Your... The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question, uh, it's my first question, so I think members should listen to my question, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> So my question, my question is for the municipal, uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs. We've learned this morning that we need to add municipalities to the list of people or groups getting a headache from the centralized health authority, Mr. Speaker. Since the health authority was created, there has been an inconsistency uh, in which municipalities get paid for municipal services they provide to the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Halifax says that the NSHA pays their bill in full, while other municipalities like Cape Breton and Inverness have struggled to be paid. So I'd like to ask the minister, what is the minister doing to ensure municipalities get paid? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for the question. Uh, the situation that he's dealing with was the decision that was made uh, in an interpretation by the old Cape Breton District uh, Health Authority before amalgamation. Uh, I'm, I ap appreciate the work that Minister Delory has done with his staff in the NSHA. Uh, as we're learning that, uh, that the settlement is coming for the CBRM. Uh, and as we move forward, we're going to open those dialogues with the NSHA to make sure that we don't have this situation happen again. I'd just like to remind the Honourable Minister not to refer to other uh, ministers by uh, surnames. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Thank you. And Mr. Speaker, hospitals need sewers, hospitals need fire protection, and municipalities provide these services, but it's at a cost to them, Mr. Speaker. The legislation is very clear, but the Nova Scotia Health Authority is seeking legal advice and clarity from the Minister's Department. This is messy and could get messier, Mr. Speaker, as we move on. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister clarify that the Nova Scotia Health Authority needs to pay uh, all the municipalities for their services that the NSHA uses. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Yes, yeah, so again, uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for the question. Uh, under the Hospital Act, uh, hospitals are exempt from taxes, but under the MGA, they can charge uh, fees for service. Uh, as this situation that took place in Cape Breton, there, there was an interpretation made by the former District Health Authority. Uh, we've been working since day one, and I have been since Minister, to get clarity around that situation. Uh, the Minister of Health and his staff have been working with the CBRM uh, through this process. Uh, we're coming to a conclusion on that, which I'm very happy about. And, uh, moving forward, I made the commitment as Minister of Municipal Affairs to sit down uh, with staff from the Nova Scotia Health Authority uh, to uh, have a more clear path forward. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question through you is to the Minister of Health. Nova Scotia Health Authority had not paid $2.7 million in fire protection and sewer rates since 2014 to the Cape Breton Regional Municipality. Now, after four long years, the Nova Scotia Health Authority has finally agreed to cough up most of the money it owes CBRM. That's great news for CBRM. But what about the other cash-strapped municipalities, Mr. Speaker? The Health Authority owes Victoria County not as much, but it's only $27,000 in back fire protection rate 
from the village of Padak dating back to 2014. So my question to the minister, will the minister direct the health authority to immediately pay Victoria County the money owed? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for uh, the question. I think this is an important question uh, to come to the floor because it highlights, in fact, Mr. Speaker, what we've been saying for several years now about the reason why it was important to amalgamate the nine different health authorities, because these are organizations, so Mr. Speaker, we're treating and, and, and uh, operating differently in different parts of the province. This is just one example, Mr. Speaker, in terms of how they uh, responded to uh, invoices from municipalities, but we see the same in the way that care and services are being provided by these organizations. When this issue was brought to my attention, Mr. Speaker, by my colleague, the Minister of Municipal Affairs, that there were these concerns from municipalities uh, about bills uh, being paid, Mr. Speaker, I directed the uh, Health Authority to ensure that they meet their legal obligations. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Mr. Speaker, the residents of Victoria County learned in the media this morning that the Health Authority refused to pay fire and sewer fees to some municipalities, like Victoria County, but their bills to other municipalities were paid in full with no problem, and I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. So my question through you to the Minister. Will the Minister explain how and why the Health Authority plays favourites when it comes to paying bills? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for uh, the question. Uh, indeed, uh, the circumstances of this situation and why there, there appears to be different uh, practices uh, within the Nova Scotia Health Authority in different parts of the region is because the practices in place were uh, in place uh, when there were nine different health authorities, Mr. Speaker. It was the previous Cape Breton uh, Health Authority. The members opposite uh, criticize and complain, uh, whether it's about the health authorities or the school boards, Mr. Speaker, that the local representation represents the people to the best, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, uh, when the practices were different, it does take time to ensure that there's uh, consistency and behaviour uh, appropriately and consistently across the province. That work's been ongoing since the fall, Mr. Speaker, and they'll continue to meet their obligations. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, that's a ridiculous response, and I'll tell you why. Mr. Speaker, Inverness County has been owed half a million dollars since 2012. So it's interesting that the problem never existed until this government amalgamated health authorities. At least not for Inverness. So Mr. Speaker, it's a lot of money. And this issue has been going on for years, and I know this government has had months uh, to fix it. It's been formally brought to them months ago by the municipality of Inverness. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, the municipality can't get a mortgage right now for one of the hospitals, Sacred Heart Hospital, uh, because this outstanding debt is hanging over them. So, Mr. Speaker, it's ridiculous. I'm, I guess I've run out of time here. My question... <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, will the minister commit today to ensuring Sacred Heart Hospital's debt is paid immediately so that upgrades can be made to that nursing home? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member uh, for the question. Uh, as I've previously mentioned, uh, when this situation was brought to my attention uh, by my colleague, uh, the former minister, or the Minister of Municipal Affairs, Mr. Speaker, uh, it was brought to my attention. I directed staff to provide uh, some information, and uh, when that information was brought, uh, more details, uh, I made it very clear in my direction to the chair of the uh, Nova Scotia Health Authority that my expectation was for them to uh, meet their legal obligations in making payments, Mr. Speaker. I directed them to uh, work with the municipalities to make sure that happened in a timely uh, fashion, Mr. Speaker. So that work was ongoing. We saw today that uh, the agreement was reached with Cape Breton Regional Municipality and expect uh, the others to continue that work as well. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Speaker, you can forgive me if I don't have confidence in this system, Mr. Speaker. It seems every time there's an issue in health care that's brought forward, there's no reply for a while, then you get some kind of a short, inconclusive reply, and at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, I don't think the health system is better since this government took charge. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want to talk about volunteer firefighters. I was at a dinner in Inverness on the weekend. These are people every two weeks, they're going and training, uh, volunteer time, they're there for us when we need them, and this government, through the health authority, has refused since 2012 to pay for those fire services. Is that not insulting to those volunteers? The Honourable Minister of Health. <clears throat> 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As I indicated uh, previously, uh, the circumstances around uh, the situation, I believe, uh, stems from uh, the previous uh, Cape Breton uh, Health Board that was in place, Mr. Speaker, that they uh, uh, changed their, their practice, Mr. Speaker. They adopted a, a particular practice based upon the billings that they received and the interpretations of the legislation as to what their obligations were. Mr. Speaker, when we amalgamated the uh, health authorities, uh, indeed, uh, other uh, regions uh, saw different practices, uh, some municipal Palities that build, some that didn't bill for the services uh, when the bills were received, some uh, health authorities have been paying and some hadn't. Uh, when the health authority amalgamated, Nova Scotia Health Authority continued the practices in those regions uh, as they were in place. It takes time to amalgamate and standardize those practices. That work is ongoing. We saw today that they came to that agreement with the Cape Breton Regional Municipality to make that payment. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Minister of Health. Dialysis patients are subject to an intensive treatment schedule in order to manage their condition. Many patients require dialysis treatments multiple times a week. For some, there's no dialysis in their immediate area. For others, the need in the area overwhelms the supply, and patients are forced to travel for their treatment. These patients worry about travel, financial burden, and timely access to the service. My question to the minister, will the minister provide the house with an estimate about how many Nova Scotians require dialysis and the province's ability to provide that service in a safe and convenient way. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for uh, bringing this important uh, question to the floor of the legislature. Uh, indeed, Mr. Speaker, uh, for those of us that uh, do not require uh, dialysis, I don't believe we can truly understand or appreciate the impact that it has on the lives of those who do. Uh, dialysis treatment, for those of you that don't know, uh, requires a lengthy uh, stay uh, to get the treatment, to have your blood uh, cleaned, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this uh, often runs multiple times uh, per week uh, for several hours uh, on each of those days of treatment. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we recognize this challenge and we're working hard. We've made several announcements and there's work ongoing uh, to uh, bring additional uh, seats uh, for dialysis to more communities uh, to reduce the travel time for those uh, that are receiving these services in parts of the province. The Honourable Member for Picto Centre. Um, Mr. Speaker, several dialysis patients in Picto County continue to find themselves on a wait list for access to the four units at the Picto Hospital. Due to the aging population in my area, demand for dialysis services is only increasing. Aging patients, increased distance, and more uncertainty is a dangerous recipe. My question to the Minister, will the Minister commit today to expanding the dialysis services in Pictou County, thereby relieving the stress of patients having to tra travel to Antigonish, Toro, or Halifax? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I again thank the member for raising this question and certainly the concerns of his constituents in Pictou County. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, while I appreciate uh, the circumstances for those that uh, in Pictou County that aren't able to receive the uh, dialysis services uh, as close as possible uh, in their community, uh, as the member mentioned, uh, those that... Uh, aren't able to uh, receive treatment in the four seats in Pictou with Aberdeen, uh, they are able to travel to Anakinish about uh, half hour, 45 minutes away for that service. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, our first priority is there are many parts of this province where patients are traveling over an hour, an hour and a half to receive treatment. So the locations that we've indicated that we're expanding dialysis services as a first priority is to limit the amount of travel time uh, in areas that have the largest travel time right now. Unfortunately, that's not Pictou County at this point in time, uh, but we will continue to try to improve the services available to all of Scotians. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs. In the fall, the Commission on Effective Electoral Representation of Acadians and African Nova Scotians conducted extensive public consultations with African Nova Scotians, something community members have said that Dr. Glaze did not do. The Commission's report emphasized the importance of African Nova Scotian seats on elected school boards, <coughs> saying they served at least five functions, including helping to link schools and the African Nova Scotian community and providing political experience for board members and even unsuccessful candidates. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, is the Minister concerned that the elimination of African Nova Scotian representatives to school boards will undermine these important functions? The Honourable Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs. No, I'm not. I have all confidence in the Minister and what we are doing in that direction. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, my next question is for the Minister of, uh, of Education. We know that right now, 
African Nova Scotians are underrepresented in government, and now your department is going to tell African Nova Scotians that, that you're choosing their representatives for them. Do you think that that is appropriate? Order, please. Just like to remind the Honourable Member not to refer to members opposite directly, but keep your comments through the Chair. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I've had conversations with representatives from the African Nova Scotian community who are obviously concerned about losing positions um, on those board structures. Uh, but the fact is, Mr. Speaker, even though we've had those positions, which have been a great gain for that community, we still have an achievement gap with African Nova Scotian students in this province that we have not been able to address properly. So this is an opportunity for us to be the architects of a new system that provides additional agency to that community and our Mi'kmaq community that ensures that they are better represented within the department, that there are resources focused on that achievement gap, and that we do a better job for our African Nova Scotian and Mi'kmaq students in this province than we have done. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Pictou Sutherland Harris Memorial Hospital has been serving the residents of the Pictou area since 1966. In recent years, however, the services offered at the Sutherland Harris Memorial Hospital have been reduced greatly. Now Pictonians are hearing that services such as blood collection, restorative care, dialysis, and even our addiction center might be the next services to go. Naturally, this is causing great concern for the residents of Pictou County. Can the minister indicate if there are any plans for further service reductions, in particularly at the Sutherland Harris Memorial Hospital? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for uh, bringing this question to the floor, uh, particularly uh, important, as I can imagine, for the, her constituents and, and people within that region. Uh, what I can tell uh, the, the members, uh, of course, uh, the Nova Scotia Health Authority and the IWK are partners uh, on the front line delivering health care services to all Nova Scotians, are working hard to ensure uh, that they are providing those services as efficiently and effectively as they can. Uh, I can also, to the specific question that the member asked, uh, uh, let her know that that I haven't seen any specific uh, proposals uh, to indicate uh, what she's uh, suggested uh, taking place. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. My colleague from Pictou Centre already raised the issue of dialysis in Pictou County, and obviously I echo his concerns. The four units in Pictou County are located in Pictou at the Sutherland Harris Memorial Hospital, but they're definitely not meeting, Mr. Speaker, the growing demand uh, in our community. To add the additional stress of this uncertainty only compounds the problem for our residents. If the units, the four units, are taken from the Sutherland Harris Memorial Hospital, then they should be replaced somewhere else in Pictou County, hopefully the Aberdeen Hospital. Will the minister commit to preserving and increasing the number of dialysis units in Pictou County? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, again the member for, for raising this question of uh, dialysis. Uh, as I've mentioned previously, uh, again, and unless you uh, are experiencing uh, the need for dialysis uh, or have someone close to you, I don't think you can truly, uh, truly appreciate the impact it has on one's life uh, to have a requirement to receive this treatment uh, lasting several hours per day to clean your blood uh, and multiple days per week. Uh, it's understandable people would want to have this service as close to home. Home, uh, as possible. As I'd indicated earlier, uh, plans uh, and the process for identifying where expansion would take place, uh, we're trying to get uh, areas that are traveling for over an hour, two hours, uh, addressed first and foremost, uh, and that, that's where uh, we've made commitments. Uh, Kentville, uh, the Valley, South Shore, I believe, uh, having some uh, Digby uh, expanded services, and that's what we're priority right now. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. Those on dialysis in the valley face the daunting challenge of traveling to Halifax three times a week for a four to six hour dialysis treatment. They cannot drive themselves, they need a driver. When you consider the travel time in that hour to hour and a half or more range, and the time it takes for treatment it is exhausting for the patient and for their loved ones. Uh, my friend who unfortunately needs dialysis was told by someone in the Department of Health to move to Halifax when he was trying to figure out how to manage the logistics around his dialysis treatments. My question for the Minister is, can the Minister of Health and Wellness tell this House and the citizens of the Valley when they can expect the dialysis unit, unit in Kentville, or does the Minister also advise move to Halifax? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, again, I appreciate the question. Uh, indeed, the, the members highlighted exactly uh, what I've been indicating in my responses to the previous questions. Uh, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, there are parts of the province where they have to travel uh, further. Uh, we recognize that in the valley. That's why uh, the work ongoing there is uh, actually one of the areas uh, further along. Uh, they've had their design completed, Mr. Speaker, and the work is uh, underway uh, to get that uh, facility up and running with those additional uh, beds. Uh, or seats uh, to provide this service uh, so that those people in that community won't have to travel uh, as uh, far uh, they can get those services uh, closer to home. Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, this government committed to dialysis at Valley Regional in a December 2013 press release, and I will table that. It has also had dialysis on each capital plan since 2013. I will not tap, ta table the capital plans. In fact, the Premier announced a 12-station dialysis unit for Valley Regional Hospital amid great fanfare on January 13, 2017, and he said the work would begin in the fall of 2017, and I just tabled that. If we had a dialysis chair for every announcement this government has made, we'd already have six or seven in the valley. Rather than announcements, I think the people in the valley would prefer a real action. So my question is this, when will the government finally follow through on all the many promises to the people of the valley and put dialysis in Valley Regional Hospital? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think uh, what the member needs to appreciate when it comes to uh, capital projects, particularly those of the healthcare sector, is that uh, these are far more complex than building a, a home, Mr. Speaker. These uh, require uh, detailed uh, design, analysis, clinical input, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so, uh, as I've said, uh, the design is completed, the investments have been made, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and uh, money has been flowing to ensure that this project uh, continues uh, to get off the ground. Uh, again, there should be, uh, as part of that as well with the designs, you have to identify the location of the site, uh, procure the, the properties and so on, Mr. Speaker. All of that takes time, uh, but uh, I assure you that uh, all of the people involved in this project have been working diligently and will get those seats up and running there in other communities like Digby, Glace Bay and in Dartmouth. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It seems the Minister of Health is answering more questions about blood than the uh, Russian Olympic team right now. Uh, <laughs> now, now, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, this one's been here. Uh, the dialysis in my area has been a question I've asked to a numerous. Uh, numerous members uh, over the last number of years. Uh, the group in Barrington Passage is looking to get a satellite hemodialysis unit in that community. The closest option right now is Yarmouth. Uh, it's 54 minutes away when weather is good, and it's either further away to go to, to go to Liverpool or Bridgewater. There are 14 people in Shelburne County right now having to travel uh, to receive that service in Yarmouth. So can the Minister of Health commit to creating a satellite hemodialysis unit in Barrington Passage for the patients of that area? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for his, uh, his question. Um, as I indicated uh, previously, I know that, uh, again, the significant impact that dialysis has on individuals uh, requiring the service uh, to uh, require uh, traveling to receive treatment in hospital uh, can uh, take, a, take a toll uh, because you do have to uh, receive this treatment multiple times a week in many cases and for several hours at a time. Um, as I've indicated, uh, to, to, I believe <coughs> recently responded to correspondence where he'd asked this, the same question. Uh, is, uh, as I've mentioned to his colleagues that have asked this question on behalf of their constituents, uh, we've got a review that was done to identify where priority areas were, uh, where the travel times were the greatest at the time. That's where we're working on getting those dialysis uh, seats up first and foremost. Uh, we'll continue to improve that over time. But the other thing I want to highlight to members is there's also opportunities to look at uh, and encourage their constituents to look at dialysis at home. It may not work for everyone, but there are opportunities where they can work with the Nova Scotia Health Authority to receive that service. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, like I said, there's 14 people in Shelburne County alone that have to travel to Yarmouth County in order to receive that service. Uh, there is a, a pocket of, of people that need the service of full dialysis rather than the home dialysis, so they really can't transfer in it. A friend of mine, Artie Smith, who lives in Woods Harbour, uh, you know, he's getting to, to the end of his rope. He said, I can't, I can't function 
uh, because of the time it takes out of my day, out of my week in order to do that. Patients cannot drive themselves, so financial demands or the demands of their families and friends will continue to add stress and pressure on the top of their condition. And I know what I'm asking for is outside the norm because there is no seats in Barrington Passage, but the distance itself should allow uh, for at least consideration. So, you know, what can the minister outline? What, the, what would the conditions be to look at uh, a community like this for the consideration of a satellite dialysis unit? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think the member uh, really hit the, the nail on the head uh, that uh, really that distance and the time impact for communities. The, the unfortunate reality is there are other communities uh, and regions that uh, have had even further distance, and that's where we've been trying to, to focus uh, on the first round of these uh, expanded dialysis uh, treatments. Uh, so we have a number of uh, projects underway for either new or expanded seats uh, across the province. That's our first priority, as his colleague uh, asked in a question earlier, is about how long it takes. So we're really focusing our resources, the project teams in partnership uh, with, uh, you know, with the health authority, the department and the Department of Transportation, Infrastructure Renewal, uh, to get these projects off the ground, get these seats in place for those uh, it, that are uh, um, going to receive them in, the, in this first round. Uh, we'll continue to look at it uh, over time as resources uh, exist and we get these projects up and running. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Business. IATSE Local 849 represents most film technicians in the province. Their members have had their hours dropped by two-thirds since the Premier broke his word and eliminated the film tax credit. Given that the government is so focused on retaining workers in the province, it seems strange that it would be content to see these significant job losses in a viable and important industry and to watch workers leave the province and go find work elsewhere. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister admit that his government's changes are costing Nova Scotians jobs? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. Uh, I've uh, enjoyed a tremendous relationship uh, with Screen Nova Scotia, Mike Volpe in particular. Uh, certainly, uh, Mike and, and the team at Screen Nova Scotia and all uh, industry players have been uh, very open and upfront about their, their industry moving forward, uh, what the next few years of production look like. Uh, obviously, uh, we are committed to working with them. We do make a, an investment on behalf of Nova Scotians into that industry. Uh, we'll continue to listen to them. They hear their concerns. I, I did receive some correspondence uh, from the, the union group Group that the, the member mentioned. Uh, look, film's important. We know that there is a, a vibrant industry here. We're going to do what we can to continue to work uh, with the stakeholders and make sure we do everything to support film in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, Screen Nova Scotia and the film industry are weathering the government's changes and continuing to show the world that Nova Scotia is a great place to make film and television, and I think all the credit is due to their work. But the bottom line is the change from a tax credit to an all-spend incentive fund is not translating into jobs for Nova Scotia creative workers. The local hiring promoted by the tax credit had spin-offs throughout the arts and culture sector. It supported our artists to pursue work that results in the innovative projects that make Nova Scotian culture and heritage so rich. Mr. Speaker, what does the minister have to say to all the creative industry workers and their families who have watched their work evaporate? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I would tell uh, those individuals to, to keep doing the great job that they're doing. Um, Screen Nova Scotia, one of, the, one of the focal points for Screen Nova Scotia for, for Mike and Erica and, and, and the entire organization uh, is to continue to share the positive message. They've done a, a number of, of uh, marketing pieces in, in uh, recent months that focus on Nova Scotia in terms of our, our scenery, of course, in terms of some of the, the financial incentives that are here, but of course the workforce. They've focused on the workforce, the people uh, who make screen and, and film so great in this province. Uh, certainly moving forward, they'll continue to do that. They've got a tremendous network uh, and, and relationships with, uh, with the film sectors across the province, the, across the, the country, and, and indeed North America. So they'll continue to do what they can. They'll continue the dialogue with us, uh, and we'll uh, work with them to improve screen and film uh, aspects for Nova Scotia. Thanks. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muskinabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. A constituent of mine invested in equipment to start a fun entertainment business involving inflatable bouncy houses. Now, to, in order to acquire a license, my constituent was informed that he had to take an elevators and lift safety course. He phoned and had his name put on the list. That was six months ago. The course is only administered when there are enough people to take the course. And there aren't enough people right now to take that course. 
So in the meantime, my constituent is paying on that investment. So my question is, um, are there any acceptable equivalents or alternatives to this particular elevators and lift safety course that my constituent can take so we can get his business up and running? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the question. Um, I'm more than willing to look into that situation and see if there's anything, any alternatives. Uh, one thing I would like to add, though, is the safety of our workers is the utmost importance. And it's very important that we uh, have these certifications in place, especially when workers are going up high and working at a high level. I do know of one organization I was talking to, they recertify every year, and I know that the time frame that they have for re recertification is very short. So I'm uh, surprised to learn that it's a six-month wait to get your initial certification, but I'm more than willing to check with the department and see what the holdup might be there. And if there's anything we can do, we will speed that process up. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. I uh, just want to uh, reiterate the safety and training courts such as this one. They are very, very important, and most people are willing to participate in them. Uh, there may not, however, be a high demand for these somewhat obscure courses at one time. The question is, with the technologies that are available these days, is the Minister's Department exploring the possibility of converting programs such as the elevators and lift safety course into online programs which could be accessible on demand? The Honourable Minister of Labour. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for the question. In terms of the safety course, I, le I leave the decisions of how they're administered to our professionals. And I don't interfere with those because, Mr. Speaker, when you're talking about an online course versus an in-person course, especially when it comes to safety gear, to harnesses, um, my initial reaction would be, how can you get across the importance of how you put your harness on, how you attach it, all the other safety mechanisms involved if you're doing it through a video. And my reaction is that this is the type of safety course that has to be done in person to ensure that the individuals have the safety they require so that they don't have a workplace accident or more importantly, as we've seen in the past, unfortunately, a workplace death. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. In June 2017, the Minister halted the school review process for the Auburn High School and Coal Harbour High School and feeder schools and my constituency and others. These high schools impact all of the residents of my constituency. On October 24th in this legislature, I asked the Minister of Education if he was willing to meet with me and the principals of the affected high schools and feeder schools. My constituents, parents, teachers and students were pleased when the Minister agreed to meet with us and I was looking forward to that meeting. I was invited to the meeting, but the principals were not. Can the minister explain to my constituents why he chose not to extend the invitation to the principals of these high schools and uh, let us know if that's possible in the future with the upcoming education changes? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As, as myself and the member have spoke, there was um, confusion on who was sending the invite. I was under the impression that the meeting was at the request of the member who would send the invite to the principals. And uh, obviously the member was under the impression that the department would invite principals. Uh, that said, I'm very happy to meet with uh, administrators in uh, her area. We've just finished a tour across the province where we met with teachers, administrators, and, uh, and staff from boards. Those conversations have proved to be very helpful. One of the challenges in the current model that we're changing is that ministers actually weren't allowed to have that direct line of communication. There was protocol in place where we were supposed to meet directly with elected board members. Of course, with the change in the system, that allows these lines of communication to be open on a permanent basis. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Uh, with all due respect, there wasn't confusion on my part. I was told I was told that you were going to invite the principals. When I found out that the principals weren't invited, we contacted your department. We were told that we had to issue the invitation. I personally had to do that, so I did so, sending the invitation to the principals. They responded in an email to me that they were not allowed to come on my invitation. It had to come for your department. So I sent that information to your assistant. I spoke to her several times over the day, and she advised me that your department was not willing to issue the invitation. So my question to the minister 
is now that we've got it cleared up, will the minister issue that invitation himself since I can't do it? And can you also tell me what's going to happen to Coal Harbour, Auburn High School and all of the feeder schools because the SOC and the parents are waiting to find out what's going to happen to those schools and they've been waiting over a year and a half. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, as, as an MLA, when I was in opposition, before I was Minister of Education, I was uh, always allowed and engaged to uh, engage with our principals and our administrators. I met with them as a member. No one's preventing the member from inviting those, those individuals to meetings. Um, as I mentioned before, a new model will actually allow for a more permanent uh, open relationship between the Minister's office, the department, and the front line. And I look very much forward to building that important relationship with our administrators and our teachers as we move forward. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Many of us know uh, the song, The Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond, and its famous chorus, and as much as it's uh, tempting to sing it, I'm not going to. You, you take the high road and I take the low road. I know it's unparliamentarian, but it's yeah, we're a lyrical lot in Cape Breton. Uh, seriously though, when it comes to uh, the Loch Lomond Road in Richmond, uh, the low road is the only one available, I'm afraid. Uh, a road so low, in fact, it's subject to extreme flooding. As I'm sure the Minister of Transportation is aware, on the 5th of February, the road was indeed flooded to the point where it engulfed a pickup truck. Uh, I'm sure he's aware because actually the pickup truck was a TIR truck. Does the Minister have any details on the conditions that led to the flooding on the Loch Lomond Road and endangered the TIR truck and its driver? The Honourable you, Minister of Transportation. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Speaker. And, uh, uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank all the people who work in the department, all 2,200 of them, who do a tremendous job, who do a tremendous job and a difficult job across Nova Scotia. When we're challenged with the extremely unusual uh, winter that we've had this year, it puts all kinds of pressure on the uh, system, especially when it comes to rain, because uh, uh, with, with the frost, it runs off, it creates all kinds of new challenges. And uh, I, I think that uh, we're, we are aware of the Loch Lomond Road situation and are looking at some solutions in terms of drainage there. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, I'm relieved to say that the TIR staff member driving the truck was able to escape without harm uh, as the water, the freezing water that is, rose up and uh, thoroughly engulfed uh, the, the windows. The staff member tried to call for help on his cell phone, but of course there's no cell service uh, in Loch Lomond as there's no many, not many areas in Cape Breton, Richmond. He was able to use his radio and call back to the depot just before the rising water shorted out the electronics on the truck, and I shudder to think of the predicament of family or a senior, and we have many of them in Cape Breton, Richmond, would have faced in the same circumstance. Can the minister report whether his department has any actions planned to avoid such a dangerous circumstance from occurring in future on Loch Lomond Road? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. <clears throat> One of the things I'm real proud of, Mr. Speaker, is our, uh, our gravel road program that we have uh, brought forward uh, from a capital perspective, which is very, very successful for uh, uh, rural Nova Scotia. In the, in the members' uh, instance, we're doing Sport and Mounting Road, Morrison Road, Grant Road, for a total of 10 kilometers of rehabilitation for gravel roads in that riding, Mr. Speaker, and all the ridings across the province. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Energy. No, most Nova Scotians don't want fracking. They made it abundantly clear to the Independent Review Panel on hydraulic fracturing, and nothing has changed since. But with the release of the Atlas showing possible reserves, the government has muddied the waters and started the conversation all over again. Mr. Speaker, is the Minister ignoring the moratorium and trying <clears throat> to open a back door to fracking in this province? The Honourable Minister of Energy. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the question. Uh, no, that's that's not the case at all. Uh, the, the moratorium is still in, a pl in place. The status quo uh, as the, for the fracking uh, piece uh, is as, as it stood back in 2014. Uh, look, there's nothing wrong with information. If, if people have, a, have an interpretation of putting out the, the onshore atlas to figure out where these, these, uh, these minerals are, where, where the gas could be, uh, there's nothing wrong with sharing that. What we said is that uh, Nova Scotians were clear back when the moratorium was put in place, and if communities had a different idea, different perspective on that, then, then so be it. Uh, they would bring that to us. So we haven't changed anything. The moratorium is what it is. We haven't considered or talked about changing that legislation. Uh, as, as, a, as a competent and responsible government, we committed to that onshore atlas. We'll put that information out there, let the stakeholders, let the public talk about it, and see where we land. Thanks. The Honourable Minister, Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, if we're going to grow a green economy in this province, we need decisive of leadership now, and that's what this government is not showing. Order, please. Time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. We'll now move on to the